Well, thank you. Good morning. It is good to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm excited. I am. I was petrified in the first service. I'm just nervous for this one. So I guess that's a step in the right direction. Um, so yeah, so Palmer mentioned, I, uh, I have been working in uh, Live Love, doing stuff in their, our, our community, City of Chandler, for a little while now. Um, I, my trade, if you don't know anything about me, my trade is social work. And so I have been working in the field of child and family counseling and adoption and community development for a little over 20 years now, and I love it. But back at the beginning, um, I, I was struggling because I was trained as a social worker. It's, kinda, it's a pretty secular uh, training and education, but I had this heart, this passion for, for people and, and for doing things God's way. And, and so I spent some time at the beginning of my career, I guess, if you want to call it that, just kind of asking God, like, how does this merge? How does this come together? And he, he took me to a passage out of Isaiah 58. And um, actually, uh, Palmer spoke out of it last week in his sermon on peace with justice because um, this chapter is a chapter where God is speaking through Isaiah and he's talking to the people and he's saying, these are the kinds of things that you should be seeing if you are living your life the way that that I want you to. If you have a heart like mine and you're doing what I'm asking, these are the kinds of things you're going to see. And so I wanted to share um, a few verses with you near the end of the chapter because it's where my heart is, it's where I come from, and I think it'll help us understand where we're going today. Um, So I'm going to start at the end of verse 9. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry. Help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you're dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. When God showed this to me, I was like, man, that is is what I want. I want to have a reputation of someone who rebuilds broken walls and restores broken homes. So it's kind of been like this this thing that's compelled me in the things that I've done. Um, And you know what? Jesus... Jesus was in the business of rebuilding and restoring. We see him do it in so many ways while he was here. And so our story this morning comes out of John chapter 4. I've asked my friend Debbie to come up and read a story for us. It might be kind of familiar to you. It's, it's about Jesus and a woman, and they're hanging out at a well just outside of a village called Sychar. But I asked Debbie if she would just read all the way through because I really want you to get a picture of what's going on in this story. So sit back and listen because I love listening to Debbie read scripture. Oh, thanks. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, 
bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on the mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Thanks, Debbie. When I first started asking God, okay, what does it look like now that I live here in Chandler, because the way I did rebuilding and restoring looked different in Newburgh, Oregon. It looked different in Guatemala City. But now I'm here in Chandler. What's that look like here? Um, God introduced me, well, not personally, but through various ways. I was introduced to um, a woman by the name of Judy Ramos. And she works for the city of Chandler in the neighborhood programs. And I sat down with her and I said, okay, Judy, what, what does it look like? Where would we go if a person like me with other people like me If we wanted to invest and really pour into a community in our city that is kind of, you know, on the outside, isolated, has broken places, what would that look like? And so it took some time. We needed to figure out. She needed to understand where I was coming from. But she, she took me on a tour. And we drove around parts of Chandler that we'd been living here a year that I I had never seen before. Um, You know, places that are kind of just outside of the hub of all the activity, or they're kind of on your way to somewhere else, places you would never land unless you intentionally chose to go there. This is kind of what's happening at the beginning of our story with John. He tells us that Jesus and the disciples are headed to Galilee from Judea. So I want to show you on a map what that looks like. Context is important to me. And so if you look here, you'll see Jesus was leaving Judea. So you see Jerusalem down there. And straight up at the top, you see the area of Galilee. That was about a 60-mile journey. But 60 miles then would have taken them between two and three days of travel. And it's hot and it's through the desert. Um, And so it's, you know, he says, we're headed this way. But here's the kicker. John throws in there, Jesus had to go through Samaria. And you're like, yep, I see it. It's right there. Makes perfect sense to me, right? Of course he had to go through Samaria. He didn't actually. And and this this is where the whole context and the whole reason that the story is significant rests. During that time, people didn't go through Samaria unless they had to. Let me, I want to give you some history about why that is. So you'll see on the map, uh, like centuries before this, the nation of Israel is one nation under one king. And where you see the word Judah and Israel, all of that land together is one nation. You've got kings like Saul and David and Solomon that ruled over all of it together. Solomon dies And the northern tribes of Israel break away to develop their own nation. They split. You see the dotted line there. So you've got Jerusalem, the center of worship and activity and culture, in the bottom region of the Judah part. And then you have Israel. they, They were cut off now. So they built their own hub of activity in Samaria. They built their own temple. They built their own palace. They started their own new hub. Unfortunately, after a series of wicked and kings that weren't following after God, God said, you know what, we, we're going to, this punishment is like inevitable. So he brings in Assyria 
a country farther away, to come in. And the king of Assyria demolishes this area, takes the Israelites living in this area of Samaria, and exiles them back up to Assyria. And in their place, he takes people from outside of his area of Assyria and puts them back in here. So foreigners moving into a new land to settle it and live it. Not only that, he actually goes back and we see in, um, in 2 Kings, he takes a priest that had been exiled from this place and he says, hey, I need you to go back into these, this northern area near Samaria. I need you to teach the people how to live there according to the ways of your God from before. So you've got this priest who's set up to try and teach brand new people, immigrants and foreigners living in this land, how to do it. Well, what actually happened is you ended up with a mix. Everything sort of started blending together. You have a mix of culture and religion and worship and the way they did things. And that became the area that we now consider it during Jesus' time, the region of Samaria. So fast forward, you've got Judah. Eventually, they end up in the same boat as the northern kingdom. They're exiled to Babylon. They're there for about 70 years, and Babylon's taken over, and a king comes in, Cyrus, and he says, hey, any Jew that wants to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild your temple, you are welcome to do that. So for decades, you've got groups of people headed back to Jerusalem. They're going to rebuild what they lost and so they get there, and you've got these Israelites now living around Samaria, these blended Israelites, and they're like, awesome, that's our history too. They head down and they try and join in, but they're told from the get-go, you are, have no part in this. You are no longer considered a Jewish person. You are not pure Israelite. You are mixed. You have blended. You aren't following God's way. You can't be part of what we're doing here in Rebuilding. So it builds more tension, right? So, so then we land here at Jesus' time, and this has been going on for hundreds of years. And the people, the religious leaders in Jerusalem, in that area, they, still, they look at those Samaritans as unclean. That becomes their name. They're, they're Samaritans. They don't even live just in Samaria. It's the region. They're unclean, and, and you, they would avoid them at all costs. So if someone was traveling from Jerusalem to to Galilee, they wouldn't go through Samaria. On the next map, you can see the dotted line said they would cross over and add days to their journey and cross the river and go around because no one wants to be unclean. So when John says Jesus had to go through Samaria, he's making a statement here. People at this time would have read this and said, why, why would he do that? <laughs> he didn't have to do that. Here's what I know. He had to go through Samaria because his compassionate heart compelled him to go through Samaria. He couldn't do, he knew about the brokenness, the broken relationships between Jerusalem, Samaria. He, he knew about that, but he knew about broken villages and broken people. And he was on his way somewhere, but he was going to do some business. And so what we learned from Jesus right from the get-go is that rebuilding what's been broken takes compassion. And so he sets an example there for us. When I started my work in Chandler, and we, we found this neighborhood that we wanted to settle in on, it was called Pamela Park. And I was ready. I was like, Lord, let's do this. So I grabbed my daughter. She's my youngest. She wasn't in school yet. And I had my questions ready, and we started knocking on doors. And I would knock and I would say, hi, my name's Melinda and I'm here because I, I, I would love to ask you some questions about your neighborhood and dreams that you have, places where you would like to see things fixed. And, and I was invited in. <laughs> it was like a miracle. I, we don't in, I don't invite people in that knock on my door. I don't know what I was thinking when I did this, but for whatever reason, I thought it would work and it did. And so um, I spent some sweet, sweet time on porches and in kitchens I ate the best tamales you've ever had in your life. And it was good, and my heart was full. And, and for two years, we worked with these families, and we did some rebuilding. We did projects with volunteers, and we painted houses, and we laid gravel, and we planted grass, and it was awesome. And so after two years, uh, I had an opportunity to move into a new neighborhood. I was like, bonus. Bonus. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to meet new people and eat more food. 
just across the way. So I, I'm ready. I take my friend Becky. I'm like, let's do this. We got our questions ready again. And I start knocking. Nobody answered those doors. I was like, what's up with this? This isn't how it's supposed to go. And, and you know, if they did answer the door, there's like the security screen. And you're like, I don't know if you're there, but I can hear your voice. And this is the kind of response I got in that neighborhood. Why are you here? Girl, you took a wrong turn. I think you're lost. We don't care that you have great ideas for our neighborhood. This is what it is, and it's going to be this way. <sighs> Kickback. That's not fun. I was ready to hightail it back to Pamela Park and go have some coffee on the porch. But God had been building in my heart a compassion for these people. This is what's happening right here with Jesus while he's sitting here at the well. They, they get to the well, and what we know about brokenness is that the reason sometimes we have security gates and protective barriers is because brokenness, sometimes in that we lose the ability to trust, right? We, we lose the vulnerability of feeling safe with people. And so the walls are high and I'm independent and I don't need you and don't you dare try and tell me how to fix it. For a long time when I read this story, I pictured a different, a different kind of woman. And then one of the truths I'm reading out of here is that restoring what's been lost takes time. We read the story. This is kind of what's frustrating sometimes about the Bible. Debbie read the story for us, and like in three minutes, it's wrapped up. You know, for like 30 seconds, you're like, oh, and then you're like, yay. It's like really fast. That is not life. That is not how it works. Jesus did not sit at this well for three minutes. Let's just say, at a minimum, he lands. The disciples are like, hey, we'll go get food. He's got to walk. They have to walk into town. They have to find whoever's selling the food. They have to barter for the food. I'm guessing the food even has to be made. They get it. They come back. Hours, right? Hours. There's so much of the story we don't know. But I used to think that this woman was a lot like my Pamela Park ladies. It was a sweet cup of water over the well kind of conversation. <laughs> and I've been studying it this last few weeks, and I'm like, no way. No way. She's a Delaware Street woman. <laughs> right? Let's, let's just go back and see what we know about her. She identifies herself, first off, as a Samaritan woman. So from the get-go, based on her ethnicity and where she lives, she's rejected. Straight away. Cut off from unclean. But then there's this other little piece we kind of have to tease out of the story. She shows up at this well in the middle of the day. The hottest part. And as I was doing some reading and stuff this last week, um, some, some of these historical documents will say that if, if we're right about where Sychar was, and if we're right that she's at Jacob's well, then, then actually there was a well on the other side of town closer to town. So the fact that she's from Sychar, but at Jacob's well, tells us that she had to go out of her way to go farther away. It makes you wonder why, right? And then there's this kicker. This is a, a Middle Eastern community. Women do everything in community. They get water together. They cook together. They raise their kids together. They hang out in tents every month together. Like, they're close, right? Who's at the well with her? Nobody. So at some level, this woman's been cut off. She's rejected. She's on the outside of the, her own sisterhood of women in her community. It's like strike two. And then as we listen to the story, we find out at like the most vulnerable spot of her life and heart, she's also been rejected. Not once, five times. Five times a man has said, you're not good enough. 
I mean, like, let that sink for a second. Do you even know someone like that? And if you do, what are the words in your head that you have about that person? I'm not saying they're good words. I'm just saying, like, we know how we feel. That gut reaction of judgment, this woman has felt every bit of it. And in her community, she's cut off and she's rejected and she's alone and she's broken and it hurts. And how do you survive that? Up go the security gates, right? There's the wall because I don't need you. You can't touch me. I'm good. Thank you. This is the woman Jesus sits with at the well. If that's the woman that Jesus is sitting with, I think the conversation goes a little something more like this. Jesus. Hey, could I have a drink, please? (laughs) Woman. What is wrong with you? You took a wrong turn, buddy. This is not your well. (sighs) Did you not realize that you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman? How could you ask me for that? And this is what I love about Jesus. He's like not offended. He's just like, um, actually, interesting. If you knew who I was, <clears throat> you'd be asking me for a drink and I would give you living water. And then can't you hear it? Uh, I'm sorry, do you have a rope or a bucket? <laughs> right? How exactly do you plan to do that? This well is deep. What I read is that Jacob's well was actually over a hundred feet deep. I mean, she's not kidding around. And then she pulls a little bit out, a little dagger. And by the way, do you think you're better than the ancestor who dug this well and used it to feed his family and flocks? Like, what's your problem? And Jesus, man, he's just like, sift, sift. He's not engaging in the argument. He's not going to sit there and try to explain himself to her. No, it's done. It's past. He's trying to go for the heart. He's not looking at this stuff. He's going for her heart. And he says to her, actually, anyone who drinks from this well is going to get thirsty again. But if you take what I have for you, it'll be like a spring that is eternally flowing, giving you eternal life. You see it? He's like parting the, he's like just parting through and he's, he's like, I see, where you're, I see where all this is coming from. I feel your pain. I, I'm trying to get at what's behind all that. And then here's the great mock of the conversation. Oh, super. Get me some of that because I'm sick of coming to this well every day. Right? But he's not offended he can, he can see past it. And that's the only thing I can explain what comes next. That's the only way I can explain it because then he's like, cool, go get your husband. Like when I read it the other way, I was kind of like, dude, go light. Why, why do you got to go there? Like the sweet woman is like hanging at the well and you dig. Like, no, I think, I think this woman was so like this that Jesus knew, I'm going for it, man. Go get your husband. Let's talk about where the pain is there, woman. <laughs> and so she gives him back the, I don't have a husband. And now Jesus aligns himself for the first time with her. He's like, you're right. You've had five. And the guy you're with now, you're not even married to him. And then this is my favorite line. You are certainly speaking the truth. Can you see him? He's like, aha. You got all this front facade stuff going on. And now you said something straight from your heart that is the truth. She's kind of called out on the table a little bit. And so her, she comes back at him and she says in verse 20, Hmm. So you must be a prophet or something. Like, you know a lot of stuff. Okay, answer me this. These are my words for her. It's not exactly the same. 
Why is it that you Jews won't include us? Why are we told there's only one way to do it, but we're rejected from being part of that? You claim everything has to happen in Jerusalem, but we can't even be a part of that. So we have our own business going on here on Mount Gerizim. Why does your system cut us out? Here's the deal with Mount Gerizim. You know, we know that this is the land where Jacob had lived, his son settled. There's history here, but here's the other thing. If you've heard at all the story about Joshua with the Israelite nation, when they come into the promised land after all those years of wandering around, Mount Gerizim is where they stood after starting their, their occupation of that land and they claimed the promises of God that he promised to do certain things for them if they lived for him. This was the mountain. So it's an important place. It is sacred in the history of these people. And she's like, you, we've got our thing and you've got yours. You say that's the only place, but no matter what we do, we're not part of it. You will not let us be part of it. Do you hear the accusation in her voice? And Jesus doesn't go to the, well, you know, I'm, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. No, he's like, I'm just going to, I got to speak truth. I got to keep speaking truth to you. Oh, woman. A time is coming when that won't matter anymore. Actually, guess what? It's already here. We're, we're in the moment right now where that doesn't matter. God is going to accept worship from anyone, anywhere, because it's going to come from a heart that worships in spirit and in truth. And by the way, I need to give you a little truth here. Part of what's been lost in this woman's soul is truth. And he's like, I don't mean to be rude, but you Samaritans, man, you don't know the whole story. You're stuck. You're, you're focused on the history of this land and the first five books of the Bible. I was like their whole thing. He's like, there's more to the story. Salvation's coming from the Jews. It's gonna be for everybody. And we're gonna worship in spirit and truth and it doesn't matter where we do that. I have what you've been looking for. And they talk about this for a while, right? And then she says, I think this is like the first hopeful thing she says to him. I know a little bit about the Messiah. And when he gets here, oh, I can't wait. He's going to explain everything to me. And Jesus is like, I'm the Messiah. I, I'm exactly what you're looking for. I am that thing that's going to make it right. And then the story stops. We're like, okay, but what else? <laughs> like, what else happened? The disciples show up. They're like, well, what's going on here? No one wants to say anything. I, I love how John writes. No one said anything because they were afraid of whatever. It, they're like, why is he talking to this woman? But remember, hours of conversation. So something shifted. Something happened because of the time that God took to, to, that Jesus took to sit with her and pour back into her what was missing, what was lost, fixing, rebuilding what's been broken. Obviously, something big happened because tell me how a woman like this leaves the well, goes back to her village, and is able to convince that village that she's found the Messiah. If you read on in the story, it says she went back and she told everybody, and they were like, what? And came running back with her, found Jesus, and said, can you stay a few more days and teach us some of this stuff? How does a woman rejected in her community suddenly have a voice? because she's got living water bubbling, overflowing so much so that she can't contain herself. Jesus took the time to love her and speak truth to her and restore her and fill her. And it was so transforming that people knew it from the minute she got back. Something's different. Jesus reclaimed this woman and she runs back to reclaim her town. Remember where it started. This is the area of Mount Gerizim. This is where promises were proclaimed long before, hundreds of years prior. On this mountain, God's going to do a work in this land. Hundreds of years it took to finally get to a place 
where they're realizing the truth of what that means in a spiritual way, not just in their physical, tangible, everyday life stuff, but like the spiritual piece of that. Promise and rest and life. And it's happening on this mountain because reclaiming what's been promised takes perseverance. It's not fast. It takes a while. And we gotta dig in. What does it mean to reclaim anyway? I'm, we're like surrounded by reclaimed wood. It's like, it's like my favorite part. We all show up here and take Christmas pictures, right? It's beautiful. If we reclaim something, it means we took something that was rejected once and we give it new purpose. It's made beautiful again. And, and this is what Jesus is doing. He's reclaiming what's been promised for this woman, but it takes time. She becomes the unlikely source of hope and salvation for her town because Jesus took the time to do it. Samaritan women and the village of Sychar are not at all unique to Jesus' day. Right? Right? I mean, we have our own places that are outside of what's acceptable or outside of where we would do business. We have people around us every day that are broken. And Jesus is giving us examples here about what do we do with that? Remember, um, I said I spent about two years working in Pamela Park and, and it was wonderful and and everything, but out of my eight years, then that means at least six that I've been working on Delaware Street. And during my time in Pamela Park, like I, I could walk down the street and be like, hey, hey, like everyone's like, oh, there's that girl. Remember that girl that speaks Spanish? She's so fun. <laughs> and, and I would walk down Delaware Street and I would be like, <laughs> hey. No haze. I, got, I finally got a hay. This is my girl Ruth right here. But Ruth, let's be honest. When we first met, you were like, what's this girl doing here? Yeah. But we sat together for a while, and I heard part of Ruth's story. And God had been building in me a heart of compassion so that when I sat with Ruth and I heard her story, I was in it. You know, sometimes those people that God calls us to, to have compassion and love, we like reach out, we like throw out our best, and they're like, they say things that aren't very nice, and they accuse us of being whatever. And it's ugly and hard, and it's just easier to be like, whatever. Like, I told you, I tried. Right? No, 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 no. If Jesus had done that here, this whole village would have been lost. We got to sit long enough. We have to persevere. We have to sit with it long enough to get to the heart. And we have a heart thing now. And let me tell you about this woman. She is going to change her neighborhood way better than I ever could because it's hers. She knows these people. She knows their pain. She's lived it. So we sit at the well and we talk about promises and we talk about the way it's supposed to be and we pray and we wait and we trust that God's going to do his thing. What does this have to do with you? It has everything to do with you because you're just like me, right? I hope you're just like me. This is not just my call. This is all for all of us. And so my question to you is this, who are those people just outside of your safety zone? Who are those people just outside that are on the way to somewhere else? Maybe they're actually in your way and you'd wish you could go around, but man, they're on the way and they're there and they need you. Where does God want to use you to rebuild and restore? Where does he want to have a reputation with you about being a rebuilder of broken places and a restorer of homes that are broken? Um, Sometimes, I, this is the hard part, you know, you ask the question, where are these people? 
And you might say, uh, I don't know because I don't look for them. So if you're like, I don't, I don't have it in me, okay, then can, can we back it up a second? And can I say, then ask God to give you compassion. We need compassionate hearts so that when we see brokenness, it matters to us. And if you're like, yeah, it takes time. And you know what? I just don't have the time. Okay, guess what? Ask God to show you how to make space so that you have time to sit. And I would say, ask for grace abounding over you for the accusations that fly. You Christians this or you whatever that, whatever you're going to represent to the broken places, it's going to kick back. How do you sit and love and wait for God to do rebuilding and restoring so that we can reclaim the promises for everyone that God's in the business of bringing people back to him.